What? You're different. Uh, Matthew 16 is where we will be this morning. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, grant to us understanding about who you are and what you're doing and to have the right appreciation for your word and to make the right emphasis to magnify most those things that you magnify most and pray that you would help us to that end. Give to us understanding about your kingdom and our part in it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if you if you are following along in uh, Vlock's book, um, which I'm trying to remember now if I bought it or if I just borrowed, I think I borrowed it on Kindle Unlimited. So if you have Kindle Unlimited, you could easily get it if you're so inclined. But he deals with Matthew 14, 15, 16, and maybe 17 together. But I, I think this morning I just want most of our attention to be on the events revolving around Matthew 16. Um, Of course, our understanding or my understanding that I am presenting to you is that it had always been God's intention uh, from the creation of Adam and Eve to rule on earth through humanity. And... We'll get to this at a, at a later time, uh, really with a little bit more reference to um, the book of Revelation. But, but part of that included, and I think this is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why I would adamantly be a kingdom literalist, is that in some measure that included God's personal appearance upon planet earth not just his heavenly superintendence of earth but of his actual presence there this is this is something that was instrumental in the kingdom of israel was uh, a manifestation of the presence of god Uh, this is something that went away in ezekiel when god just prior to god sending the people into exile um Would you like your students, Ms. Page? Okay. No, that's fine. Glad to, I, th- I was under the impression you weren't going to be here. So. Okay. So anyway, so those of you that are normally in Mrs. Page's Sunday school class, she is here, and you can you can go to. Yeah, Marlene's back there. So those of you in the Sunbeam class can go. Yeah, Dan. Um, The Lord physically departed in the book of Ezekiel. His presence left the temple. And uh, there's an entire progression to that. Um, And then the presence of God returned when Jesus Christ came to earth. Um, So that the rejection wasn't just simply a rejection of Jesus the man. It was yet another manifestation of Israel's rejection of God. And uh, we are... (coughs) If, if I understand the scriptures correctly, this is, this is what we're waiting for. And while there is a sense in which we are waiting for the rapture and glad for the rapture, the, the ultimate conclusion to the rapture, folks, will be that God will come back to earth bringing his people with him and we will reign on the earth. This is what we're really waiting for. This is, this is, this is what the, you know, whatever the individual components of the kingdom are, right? It is... 
We are awaiting a situation in which God in the person of Christ is physically going to rule from planet Earth, specifically the city of Jerusalem, over all the nations of the Earth, um, <clears throat> constituted however they are at, at that present moment. And historically, again, this is another thing that we as Americans uh, choke on a little bit, his, his, his focus has always been more upon the Middle East and Middle Eastern nations and the other nations like us have a very distinct peripheral role, not necessarily a significant role in that, but that's something we will worry about at a later time. So Christ came, God in the flesh, and from the beginning of his public ministry, Matthew chapter 4, and in fact, we'll make note of this because Matthew 4 and Matthew 16 both repeat, repeat an expression that are found only in those two places in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 4.17, Jesus began, right? From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? So the king had arrived and he had come bringing his kingdom with him. And <clears throat> so then, of course, he goes on the public ministry of both informing people, right, his sermons, and instructing them, and demonstrating his worthiness and his credibility as the prophetic messenger. Um, <clears throat> so he is, he is the word of God become flesh, and he has a message, and people should believe the message because of the one who is speaking the message and the demonstration of the authority to speak the message are the fact that he can do miracles, right? I mean, it's not a carnival. Um, <clears throat> it, is, it is a very real demonstration of power that belongs only to God, wielded through Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Um, <clears throat> and then that leads us then, of course, to Matthew chapter 12, which is, again, a really significant event with dimension of the kingdom, because the Pharisees declared that power, right? They didn't say he's not really doing those things. They said he is doing things that human beings cannot do, but he is doing it in demonic power. Um, and so in Matthew chapter 12, and you could turn to it. I mean, it's not really a focus this morning, but Matthew chapter 12, verse number 26, right? Jesus said, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, right? Because Jesus came casting out Satan. Casting out demons. So if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom is come unto you. So that's Jesus' Jesus's interpretation of their rejection of him is still heavily laden with concept, concepts of the kingdom in which Jesus agrees that he has a kingdom and Satan has a kingdom, that, are both, that, 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 that they are both competitors, all right? I mean, you know, so we shouldn't get all confused about the point that Jesus is making because we could easily just, we could understand it by applying it to ourselves, right? I mean, this is what Paul said, take heed that you don't bite and devour each other. If a, if a local church turns against itself, right, and views its own members as enemies, and goes on the war and the rampage to, to get rid of enemies, right? How, how, can, how can a church survive when it is turned against itself, or to ask a bigger question, right? How can America continue to survive as divided as it is against itself, right? We're not just divided, folks, as a nation. We are divided against each other, there are two clear lines drawn about what America should look like and how it should conduct itself. How can it survive? Right? It isn't united. This is the question that Jesus is making, right? He's casting out demons, and the Pharisees said, you're doing that with satanic power. And he said, well, I'm just working against myself then. Right? I'm just working to my own destruction. I'm, in effect, committing some form of suicide. But on the other hand, if I am casting out demons in God's power, then you should know that the kingdom has come upon you. 
right? There, there, is, there has been folks since Genesis 3, right? That, that is the defining, so to speak, defining moment in all that goes on in earth is that God has a seed and Satan has a seed and they're living in the same turf and they are mortal enemies. And <clears throat> that's, that's not just fodder for, for movies and novels. That is reality, the, the world in which we are living. It, it undergirds all that we do and, and the way that we think about virtually every aspect of Christianity, this is the question, folks. What side are we on? And is it obvious not only to the Lord, but to everybody else whose side we are on in this ongoing conflict between God and Satan? So that constitutes, to go back to Matthew chapter 12, right? At that point in time, right? That, that, that really kind of marks, right? Kind of the, 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 the nail in the coffin, which on the one hand, we would argue we knew had to come, right? Because the only way all of the Old Testament promises about the nature of the kingdom could be fulfilled was if there was some way that the kingdom was going to be offered to others and it wasn't going to be offered to others if national Israel embraced it at that time, okay? So now I'm jumping way ahead again, right? I'm just kind of going off track. But my understanding of the scriptural picture is, right, to, to play off of Romans 11, right? My understanding of the scriptural picture is, so from that point in time, God began to turn his, his attention to the Gentiles so that he's going to save all the Gentiles that are going to be saved, at which point in time he will return his attention to the nation of Israel who will accept him as their king. And this is where Paul is ultimately going with this. So all Israel will be saved, Romans 11, 26. So... <clears throat> So after the rejection, Matthew chapter 12, after the Pharisees say, well, you're just doing this in Satan's power, right? It is on those heels that Jesus begins to talk first to the crowd and then to the apostles about the nature of the kingdom, these kingdom mysteries. Then you have the events of chapter 14 and the events of chapter 15, which I'm not arguing anywhere are insignificant. We don't really return clearly to the mention of the kingdom until Matthew chapter 16. And at this point in time, right, at this point in time, Jesus begins to intersect the kingdom with the cross. And this comes as a revolutionary revelation even to his most devoted followers, as we will see. Right? So, so we've been... I mean, not we, not me, but I mean, the Bible has been laying a groundwork for God's kingdom from Genesis chapter number one. And the king shows up at the incarnation. And the king is rejected as being an unfit, unworthy, whatever, however they interpret it, demonically empowered fraud. And now Jesus is going to begin to talk again to his disciples about the kingdom as it relates to the cross. All right? So I've already read this. So if you want to just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm going to kind of jump into the middle here because I think that these are important indicators to us. Right? Matthew 4.17 tells us from that time, right, Jesus gets baptized. He goes into the wilderness. He is tempted. He passes all of those tests. From that time, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 16, 21, from that time, that expression is found only twice in Matthew, and those are the instances. From that time, Jesus began to preach, repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 16, 21, from that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So Matthew 16, this is my point this morning. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 28, provide yet another significant moment in the way we should think about and anticipate the kingdom. 
Because we are waiting for the kingdom, folks. We are waiting for the kingdom. We are waiting, of course, for the king, but we are waiting for a kingdom. And one of the reasons that we're waiting, that we know we're waiting, <clears throat> is because of the way Jesus begins to talk now in verses 13 through 28. <clears throat> so let's turn our attention there. We'll begin <clears throat> verses 13 through 17. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Simon, son of Jonah is what it means. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. We are relatively late in the earthly ministry of Christ at this point in time. He, he doesn't be even really begin to go down this road until he is fairly close to the events of the crucifixion. So, so the apostles have been following him along, listening to him preach, watching the miracles, believing in him, but not really fully understanding how any of this is going to work. And this characterizes them right, <clears throat> through most of that, that period of time, and I don't mean that in any way to, to be bad-mouthing them, but we, we'll see in just a few minutes that, that all the way through the earthly ministry of Christ, they're pretty confused about what it means, right? I mean, they, right, this is very clear, folks. They, they are very clear who Jesus is. They are not very clear about how that's going to play out and what that really means. What does it mean that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God? <clears throat> Upon this correct answer, right, which Jesus is very clear to point out is not an answer derived by logic. In other words, folks, right, that present situation could have continued for millennia where Jesus was doing miracles creating food out of midair, preaching authoritative sermons, accurately interpreting the Old Testament. And without the supernatural revelation of God, they would have never completely understood what, who Jesus was. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. You didn't you didn't get that through ordinary human means. That is a supernatural revelation. <clears throat> so there's the first part, right? Because we're, we're moving, again, I would argue, into this critically pivotal moment in the life of the apostles that, that is going to become critically important to us. And it begins with nailing down the identity of Jesus. Right? Who is Jesus? Who am I? Who, what, is, what is the common opinion of me? What do you think? Why is, right, we could put it this way, folks, why is their assessment of Jesus different than everybody else's assessment of Jesus? And if you really just wanted to back up and look at the broader picture, and I'm just kind of talking now, right, the Pharisees were very clear who they thought Jesus was. They thought Jesus was an agent of Satan. You're doing these things in the power of Beelzebub. So they clearly thought that Jesus was satanic. When Jesus posed the question to the apostles, whom do men say that I am? The reports are all pretty stellar. In other words, who among us would be offended if somebody, if, if, if you found out that somebody, you know, you're not a part of the conversation until after the fact, and somebody said about you, who is that guy? Tell me about that guy. And somebody said, well, he's, you know, he's the kind of, he's maybe John the Baptist. Would, would any of us be offended to be likened to John the Baptist, to be confused with him? 
Would any of us have our feelings hurt if somebody really thought we were Elijah or Jeremiah or any of the other prophets? Would, 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 would that hurt your feelings? So all of these are favorable responses. They are all to some extent logical, right? Somebody has been thinking about the Old Testament, thinking about the nature of that ministry, correlating it to Jesus Christ and what he's doing, and come to the conclusion, looks like John the Baptist to me. Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Well, you didn't get that from men. So there is a clear understanding of the identity of Christ. Upon that, verses 18 through 20, the kingdom belongs to those who grasp that. The kingdom belongs to those who grasp that. I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And so we're keeping his identity under wraps. <clears throat> but the kingdom, the kingdom belongs to those who rightfully understand and accept the identity of Christ. Who am I? You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You're Peter, right? Which means rock. And of course, there's a lot of theology debate about what is exactly going on there. You're the, right? I mean, right? I mean clearly the, the Roman Catholic position, folks, is that Peter is the rock and Peter then becomes the founder of the church um, <clears throat> and its first pope. The more realistic, just looking at the explanation there, is that the more realistic, right? The, the, it's not Jesus saying, you're Peter and I'm going to build the church on you, but I'm going to build the church on this rock. And it appears that the rock that is being built is the identity of Jesus Christ. And I think that we could pretty much argue for that solidly on the basis of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid Jesus Christ. Right? So that the bedrock is not Peter, the bedrock is Christ. And, right, our common bond, folks, right? Our common denominator bond is our agreement upon the identity of Jesus Christ, that he is God in the flesh, God in a human body. And so this then becomes... The, the essential condition, right? <clears throat> so upon that profession, that would be the way I understand it, upon that understanding of the right identity of Christ, access to the kingdom is given. And in verse number 19, I will give unto thee, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right, let's just kind of walk through this, right? Upon their clear recognition of who Christ is, Jesus proclaims to them that he is going to confer upon them the keys to this kingdom. While verse number 18 is greatly debated as to what the rock is, there is almost no debate about the symbolism of keys, right? Keys are representative of authority and access. People who have keys have access. I mean, it's just that simple. <clears throat> A lifetime ago, I worked at Indiana State Prison. Indiana State Prison was obsessed with control of keys. You didn't want the wrong people to have the wrong key. You didn't, you, didn't want, you didn't want the key to the cell house to be handed over to one of the inmates. 
and key control was critical. If you have Black, Vlock's book, and I really like Vlock's book, but Vlock argues that what is happening here is that Jesus is giving authority to the apostles during the actual kingdom itself. That that's what is being described in verse number 19. So that what Jesus is now doing in verse number 19 is fast forwarding whatever the amount of time is until we're in the actual kingdom and authority and access will be vested in the apostles at that time. I really like Block's book, but I just don't think that's it at all. I think, I think the keys represent authority to enter the kingdom. And what's happening here, right, is that authority to enter the kingdom is being delegated to the apostles. Who am I? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Very good. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And I don't want to go back into this, folks, when we dealt, when we worked through our way through the Gospel of Matthew. But I do just want to make this emphasis. Right? We don't want to misread verse number 19 into thinking that the authority belongs to us. And that the decisions that we make have obligated heaven. That really technically isn't what Jesus is saying. It's a little bit complicated grammatically in the way the verbs are being described there. What Jesus is actually arguing is that on the basis of heavenly authority, they can bind and loose. And, and, and we'll come back to that. Right? Right? What Jesus is doing, giving to Peter, and I think giving to the apostles, who we know are the founders of the church. I mean, Christ is the foundation of the church, and the church begins to go into operation as the apostles go out with the gospel message, and they are the first to found churches, right? That heavenly authority is delegated then to those who have the correct identity of Jesus Christ. Here's the question that I would ask, and this is the question that I would ask in light of Mike Flock's <clears throat> explanation. Why is Jesus giving to any human being kingdom authority? What is, what is the point I mean, right, again, just, just to be kind of stupid, right? If we're standing back there outside of Kelly's office and it's locked, you and I are standing there, and I have key to the office, and we want into the office. You say, can you let me, can I get into Kelly's office? Why don't I just unlock the door for you? Why would I need to say to you, okay, well, I'm going to give you the key and you unlock the door. But there have been times when something is going on around here and somebody needs to in a classroom and somebody said, anybody have a key? That I'll just take my key off because I have a master key, as many of you do. I'll just take the key off and throw it to somebody and go into the classroom because I'm not there. Because I'm not there. Why is Jesus delegating authority to the kingdom, to the apostles? We're going to get to this, folks, but he's not going to be here in that physical kind of sense. He's going to be here in a very real sense. He's not going to be here in that kind of physical sense. He is going to employ other human beings in this message. Yes, sir. I agree. That's exactly what I think it is. <clears throat> right? so, so, so Dave said, you know, it's like the guy, and I think it's a little broader than the gospel message, but, right? but the gospel message is perfect, okay? Right? So we have, so, but here's the, here's the point that I'm making, and I really wasn't trying to get into all of that, right? Is Matthew 16, 19 arguing, 
right? Because it kind of reads that way in the English. That whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. All right? So I have, I have the gospel message. So supposing that I want the gospel message to be, right? Here's the gospel message. If you get baptized when you're eight days old, the good news is you're in heaven. Does heaven have to let you in? Because I said so? Is that what Jesus is arguing here? That, that whatever we decide it is, is where the authority is? This is why I think it's important, folks, that we understand that in the passing over of the keys, right? Jesus is obligating us to the truth of the gospel message. On the other hand, by what right do we have, do we have to say to any human being, if you will simply believe, that Jesus is God who came as a human being and died on the cross in your place as your substitute, and every sin you have ever will or ever will commit will be forgiven, and you will be in the presence of God eternally. What right do I have to make that claim? Because heaven has authorized us to make that claim. Or are we just being, for instance, folks, the stance that we take on certain sins... Are we just being belligerent and count? I mean, is that just our nature that we just don't like certain people and so we're just, we're just opposed to certain, right? Do we, just, do we just like abortion because we're conservative and we don't like abortion? Or do we think that heaven has weighed in on this matter of human life and that all people are obligated to live under that realm? Or more specifically with relationship to the text, People who will not submit to heavenly authority have no claim to heaven's kingdom. And I think that's the point that's being made there. Paul. Right. Absolutely. We're going to, and we're going to come back to that. That is exactly right. But Right? But, the, but the question then becomes, Paul, right? Because wasn't that what Jesus is already doing? That's my point. Right? He's going away. So that's going to have some implication on the timing of the kingdom. If the king is going away, then that's going to say something about when and what the kingdom looks like. Right? And, and I think that's the point, is that the king is going away, and this is kind of a preview that the king is going away, and he's getting ready to kind of announce that he's going away, and that's where the revolution is going to be. Yes, ma'am. Right. Don't tell anyone. Yes. I, I agree. It's all right, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to transfer that authority over to you, right? Which is, I would argue, the, the authority vested in the Great Commission. Go preach the gospel, make disciples, make followers, right? We don't, we don't get to write the gospel. We don't get to edit the gospel. But we do get to say to people, if you'll believe the gospel, here's what God said to you. And if you reject the gospel, here's what God said to you. So let's go back to the text, <clears throat> all right? So, a proper identity of Jesus Christ is a requirement for entrance into the kingdom because the king is going to go. And that's verse number 21. From that time, right? We got this, these two pieces in place. From that time, Jesus, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. And Peter grabbed him is what the idea is and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 
For the Son of Man <clears throat> shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. All right? There's a future tense explanation there, verse number 27. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So I'm arguing, folks, that there is a progression of thought that is critical to our understanding of the kingdom, which is a right identification of Christ is essential for entrance. That becomes the basis for whoever has the keys to authorize entrance. And that it is essential for those keys or that authority to be delegated to others because the king himself is going to be crucified and implied in this text is that he is going to go away. And it is also, by the way, folks, <clears throat> right? It is also within the framework of verses 18 and 19 that we have the first mention of the church. How did the church get brought into this picture? We're talking about the identity of Christ. We are talking about the, the grounds of acceptance. We are talking about the transmission of heavenly authority. And all of a sudden we are talking also about the church. And, and, and I raise that because one of the questions or the issues that comes up is that the church and the kingdom are the same thing. That the church and the kingdom are the same thing. But I don't think so. I think that what Jesus is really arguing is that that authority that is first given to the apostles who are critical, Ephesians chapter 4, right, is going to be wielded through the local church. And, you know, here's my chance to jump one more time upon my soapbox. Folks, in the United States of America, in the Western world, we have so diluted the significance of the church that it is really sad. Because we just, we just keep adding all of these things to the church that we think are essential to make Christianity go. All of this parachurch stuff, all of these extraneous things, we just go, you know, man, if we just don't have this, you know, the, and it's, we, we, it just seems that we never seem to ask the question, are we helping the church or are we just really weighing the church down from its, from its mandate? But that's, that's another subject, and that's just me. Right? I think that the authority is intended to be wielded not through the individual man, Peter, and a succession of popes, but through the local church, that I will build my church. <clears throat> All right? How am I doing on my time? Well, we're going to take the time to do this. All right? In Matthew, well, you, and you have it here, right, in verse number 27 of Matthew 16. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father and with his angels. And then shall he reward every man according to his works. That is clearly, a, there is clearly a future dimension to that. Matthew 25, 31 talks about when the Son comes in his glory, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, is the way our King James read, his glorious throne. Read Revelation 4 and 5 to read about the glory of the throne. Jump ahead, if you would, to Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 28. Or verse number 27. Matthew 19, 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, in the renewal, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Yet one more reason, folks, why I think that we should never for a moment entertain the fact that there's not going to be a distinct nation of Israel. Reconstituted as it was in the Old Testament, twelve distinct tribes. And that what God has for the apostles during that reign is that they will have some kind of 
judicial function. They will be judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But there is also, folks, and we have to, of course, leave the Gospels in many ways to find that, but there is a clear, distinct Gentile component to the kingdom, 1 Corinthians 6.2. And there is certainly a role for the church in the kingdom. Read the seven letters to the, book of Reve- in the, to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Now, I do want to just take a moment and make this note, right? Because when we talk about the church, and this is yet another one of those places where there's a gigantic fight, as you might, you know, surprise, surprise, we fight, um, right? Is the church only local in nature, or is there a local and universal dimension, and some Baptists do not believe in a universal aspect of the church? I do. Um, I do because of a passage like Matthew 16, 18, which is promising perpetuity to the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Um, And one of the points that I, the differences that I would make is that the universal church is guaranteed perpetuity. Individual local churches are not. What did Jesus say in Revelation 2 and 3? I'll take your candlestick. I'll close the doors to your church. The other major distinction between a universal church and the local church is that the universal church is constituted only of true believers, something that is not true of local churches. Local churches are periodically required to treat their own members as unbelieving people because of their conduct if it becomes bad enough and if it's not dealt with and if it's unrepented. And so we, we struggle in that Matthew 13 mystery parable kind of sense of the word, but the Lord knows those that are his. On the other hand, virtually all of God's commentary to the church and about the church and his instructions to a church are local in nature. In other words, I believe in a universal church, but it doesn't become a substitute for the local church. Right? God wants his people, just like you are sitting in buildings, collections of individuals that constitute genuine and authentic true bodies of believers. Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 both identify, and this is significant, both identify the church as Christ's body. All right, so let's, let's go back and superimpose that on Matthew 16. Here's Jesus, a man, the God-man, walking around or riding in a boat or riding on a donkey, the nation of Israel, preaching the gospel, preaching the kingdom, doing his ministry. At his crucifixion and then the subsequent resurrection and ascension, that physical body will be changed it will be reconstituted into the new body, right? And so he will become, as Paul explains to us in 1 Corinthians 15, the first fruits. He will be the very first one to have the kind of body that we're all going to have eternally. And he will then go to heaven at his ascension where he will be our head our true head. And I think, by the way, that that doesn't, that's not just a, an authoritative sense of the word, not just our boss, but the true head of his true body, which is his church. So he will become the head of the church, we are the body, and this is not weird, folks, in some kind of science fiction sense of the word, where in heaven Jesus is a head without a body, and we're down here a body without a head. But that there is a genuine union, invisible to us, that Christ is the head and we're the body right now. That we are, that we are speaking in his power, with his authority, proclaiming his message and his gospel. It's all brought together, by the way, in the first part of Acts, right? When, when, which Luke wrote the gospel of Luke, And then he came back and he wrote Acts, and he begins Acts by telling the same man, Theophilus, let me tell you about what Jesus began to do and teach. That was the book of Luke. And now he's continuing to do and teach the very same thing through the church. 
Right? The church has the message of evangelizing not just Israel, but the world. And we have the same authority behind us. And in fact, without, you know, and I just don't have time to get into all of that. But, but folks, right, when Jesus said, lo, I am with you even to the end of the world, right? That's not just in a, um, an encouragement sense of the word, right? Ephesians 4 is pretty clear, right? That when we preach, it is actually Christ preaching, right? Jesus isn't tagging along as the silent junior partner to the church. That when we proclaim the gospel, it is he himself who is proclaiming that gospel through us. And this is part of the reason that we're able to wield that authority with such confidence. But we also need to wield it with great caution, right? That we don't corrupt the message. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to our trust. I want to go back in the last couple of minutes that I have, and once again, I'm pushing my time, but I want to go back once again to Matthew 16, 28, right? Matthew 16, 27, there is a distinct future dimension here. Someday Jesus is going to come in the glory of his Father with the angels. Right? This is what we are anticipating, and he will reward every man according to his works, which is what we are expecting for the kingdom. And then Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right, so there's certainly an implication of the passage of time, but the question is how much time? There be some here that will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Is it the same amount of time as verse number 27? Some people say that Jesus just plainly misspoke here, verse number 28. And others say that what Jesus is referring to is his crucifixion and his resurrection. And certainly, folks, and again, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but Ephesians 1, 18 through 23 argue that the resurrection was a powerful demonstration of God's, not only his approval of Christ but of his ability. But I think the most realistic explanation is the transfiguration that is described in Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, and his brother bringeth them up into an high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Without reading it all, because the, the passage really extends down to verse number 13, Jesus then is transfigured. He is, he, he's not just spotlighted, but he is literally from within transformed into the glorious being that John sees in the book of Revelation. He is discussing with Moses and Elijah his exodus, his departure. They're having that conversation. And I do think that Peter's attempt, right, misguided as it is to, to build, to erect three tents is not just off the wall, but reflects his understanding that what the end game is, is for God to dwell on the earth with us. Right? This idea of a tabernacle, folks, is pretty well entrenched in Peter's mindset. I mean, he was a man who was raised on, on Bible accounts, I, was, I don't want to say stories because they're not stories, on Bible accounts of the indwelling presence of God at the tabernacle and the temple. And he understood the departure and the significance of this. It is, it is something that a believing Jew would really want for God to come to earth. So let's, let's build a place for God to live. Let's build a place for God to live. But he's obviously in error. Now, do let me ask you to do this. I'm going to try and do this quickly. Turn, if you would, first, 2 Peter chapter number 1. And, and, and the, the condensed version of where I'm going with all this, right? we keep talking about the kingdom, and Jesus began by preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But when he really sits down and begins to explain this to the apostles, it becomes obvious that there is a, there is a provision for a very long process of time before that kingdom is going to be up and running in any kind of coherent, and I don't want that coherence bad, complete, consummated sense of the word. 
Right? It's, it's, going, it's going to necessitate the king coming in his glory with the heavenly angels. In effect, heaven coming to earth. So what, what is he talking about in verse number 28? Second Peter 1, 13. I think we should let Peter interpret Matthew 16, 28 for us. Right? There will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. 2 Peter 1.13, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It seems that Peter's interpretation in Matthew 16, 28 was the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw the king in his glory. We saw the king in his power. And that then becomes, folks, the, the, the basis for, for this. Verse number 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. A more certain word. Where until you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place till the day dawn, the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture is any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Right? We, people who tend to wish for visions and dreams are really truly misguided when they have something as rock solid as the Scripture. Okay, happy to talk to you privately at 7 minutes to 11. Got to go. Got to dismiss it.